Good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Um, in fact, uh, the committee reported, while I was there, we reported three energy bills, uh, two of which became law. Uh, so we had a pretty good run there. Uh, and we got awfully close uh, in 2009 uh, with, some, with some great policies. Uh, a few friends here, like uh, Kevin and Jonathan, both were big fans of pieces of our bill. And, uh, and as I was telling Kevin earlier, I'm, I'm still hopeful that some of those things will resurface. You know, you, you have to have a long view in the policy circles around here. And uh, so I, I've adopted that, that view that, you know, nothing, nothing is ever quite dead. Um, <laughs> with that uplifting uh, frame, and let me uh, le le let me uh, move on a little bit to um, uh, as I was looking through the agenda and some of the speakers, and I, I managed to catch a little bit of the last panel, um, which was intimidatingly good. Um, so I'm, I want to tr see if I can uphold that. Um, I think the thing that this points to, and, and, and actually is the point that I wanted to, to get to today, is that um, we really are living in a time of tremendous change in the energy sector. Uh, you know, whether, you, whether you consider it disruptive change, disruptive technology, or, or just looking at the incremental uh, effects um, of technology, um, we're, we're, we're at a, a really unique time and place. And so let me take just a, a slight step back uh, and try to go through at least a few of what I see as, as some of the key drivers. Um, I think that, you know, the, the first and most obvious, I think, um, no, let, let me back up one, actually. Let me, let me finish this. Um, is the changing global energy landscape. Uh, we're seeing now world energy consumption growing very quickly and development of new markets almost overnight in many parts of the developing world. Uh, and as is the, those developing countries industrialize uh, really rapidly. Uh, in fact, the Energy Information Administration has projected that over the, the 30 years between 2010 and uh, 2040, world energy consumption will increase by 56%. But as you know, most of that growth uh, will take place in the non-OECD countries, uh, which presents some interesting challenges uh, in places like the United States, where demand growth has has shrunk to, to nearly zero. So that's that's sort of the, the number, the overriding uh, context here, where the technology development that has traditionally come out of the United States is now against an, a, a, a near zero growth uh, environment, whereas the rest of the world is is industrializing rapidly. Second, and, and more close to home, is the, the current revolution in natural gas and unconventional resources. Um, the, the breakthrough advances in horizontal drilling and in hydrofracking uh, and their subsequent years of, of incremental uh, improvements have taken uh, production far beyond really anyone's expectations in the, in the recent past. And so this leads to a situation where the perception of domestic energy scarcity in the United States is, is giving way to uh, perceptions of, of, of energy abundance. And that has a, a fundamental effect on, on the way perceive, people perceive energy policy and what our, what our needs are. So let's take that as the second factor. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can completely transition to a policy of energy abundance because of the third thing, which is the critical challenge of climate change. Uh, and so we cannot uh, completely uh, assume that we can, we can use all fossil resources to their, their fullest extent because we have this, this fundamental economic drivers. And, and the findings of the new report from the UN International Panel on Climate Change are sobering and re really do reinforce the urgency uh, uh, of our need to act as, as soon as possible. And, and as I'll touch on in a, in a, in a bit, um, these effects of, uh, and the threat of climate change are real and can only be reduced by limiting the rate and magnitude uh, at which the, the, the change is happening. And fi finally, the, let me, what I want to cover is the good news. Uh, and, and that's the technology revolution I think we're seeing 
right now uh, across the board in, in, in energy. And this has sort of been a long-standing uh, belief that we would hit this technology revolution. And, and I'm, I'm here to say today, at least in my opinion, it's, it's arrived. And so we're not, we're no longer dreaming of, of a future uh, where um, these, these, things, these things can come, but we are, we're living it now. And that, that presents challenges and opportunities. And so you've, you've heard from uh, uh, leaders representing a bunch of points of view uh, across this, but I think you know the, the 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 theme that has come through is that this is a unique time and place. So let me let me revisit a little bit in a little bit more depth the the, the climate change uh, uh, difficulty we're in. Um, so if we look at climate change, we we see this a really compelling story of action for action. This is the representation just from Munich Munich Ray of the uh, costs of recent climate disasters. Um, and this is only one component of, of the cost. Uh, we've had the, the 12 hottest years on record have all come in the last 15 years. Each of the last three decades have been successively warmer at the Earth's surface than any preceding decade since 1850. Increasing floods, heat waves, and droughts have not only taken a toll on nation's farmers, but they've led to rising food prices. And in 2012 alone, there were more than 11 different weather and climate disaster events with estimated losses exceeding $1 billion each across the United States. So we have to remember that there's, there's a real human and social cost to, to our energy uh, landscape. And then getting, this is, this is a real eye chart, we're not gonna get into the, into the depths of this, but what I wanted to point out is that, that we have acted, last May, federal agencies along with numerous White House offices released an update on how we, would, how we value uh, avoiding the, these, these damages and the, and the social cost of carbon. Uh, I know there are economists in the room, so we won't, we won't get into the discount rates and all the other various aspects of this. But the important point I wanted to make about this is this is a mechanism, the social cost of carbon, that allows agencies to incorporate the social benefits of reducing carbon dioxide emissions into the cost benefit analysis of their actions. And, and, and what their, at least is some measure of their, their cumulative impact on global emissions. It includes, but is not limited to, changes in net agricultural productivity, human health, property damages from increased flood risk, and the value of ecosystem services due to climate change. So it's, this is another component, doesn't include everything that Munich Ray does, and, and, and again, is, is a measure and one way to, to begin to look at this. So, so while we can argue about the specific uh, models and the, and the appropriate cost and, and discount rates. The, the power of the social cost of carbon is to begin accounting for these aggregate impacts and really for the first time to inform our decision making and planning moving forward. And so the president summed it up at Georgetown University last June during the State of the Union in January uh, and during the State of the Union in January where he said, we have a moral obligation to leave our children a planet that is not polluted or damaged. And, and summed up here, that when our children's children look us in the eye and ask if we did all we could to leave them safer and a more stable world with new sources of energy, I want to be able to say, yes, we did. And so as he pointed out in this speech, particularly at the speech in Georgetown, it will take a concerted global effort to really address this problem. But future costs, uh, continue to mount while we try to find the best policy framework to address the problem. So if we're truly going to avoid passing this climate debt on, on to the next generation, as he said, we can't wait. And so this, is, this was the reason that he introduced the Climate Action Plan. And so the, the Climate Action Plan uh, focused on three main areas, mitigation, adaptation, and international cooperation. And we've continued to play a critical role in helping turn this, this climate action plan in, into a reality. And the way we do that at the Department of Energy is through our all of the above approach to energy. So this means uh, more advanced fossil fuel projects, avoiding reducing or sequestering greenhouse gas emissions, expanding and modernizing the grid, conducting a quadrennial energy review, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, 
uh, and developing and deploying advanced transportation technologies and establishing a new goal for energy efficiency standards uh, in, in, in appliances and in, uh, and in buildings. And it's important, but it's, but it's really important for us to recognize that the Climate Action Plan is a short-term tactic and a larger overall strategy. It's part of what the United States is doing to show our commitment to addressing climate change, but it is by no means enough. Luckily, the technology story of the last few years tells us that we may not have to wait as long as we fear. Let me just give you a quick overview of, of uh, EERE so we have a little bit of context. Um, EERE uh, is, is a, composed of 10 technology offices organized into three pillars uh, that, are, that attempt to, to better break down the known barriers to clean energy market entry. Those three pillars are sustainable transportation, renewable electricity generation, and energy savings in homes, buildings, and manufacturing. So let me get to the technology story. First in wind. As a result of our work and the work that has been done with our partners across industry, our national labs, and academia, America is at the threshold of a major shift in the low carbon economy. Land-based wind, shown here, was, was the fastest growing source of electricity in 2012 and represented 44% of all new generating capacity that year. And by 2017, you're gonna start, start to see this same kind of curve reappear in, in the offshore as we begin to, to premiere those turbines here in the United States. And in solar, the same, the same basic story. You see as deployments, deployments dramatically increasing, costs dramatically decreasing. In fact, the cost of solar voltaic, photovoltaic modules has fallen so dramatically that today they cost just 1% of what they did 35 years ago. That's incredible progress. And at the, you know, at, at the time that, that President Carter put solar panels on the roof, we were several breakthroughs away from that actually being a commercial product. And today, we're not, we're, not, we're not looking at breakthroughs in solar PV. We're not, you know, we, we don't have to improve the efficiency dramatically or the cost of production. Those, now, incremental progress can get us where we need to be. And that's, and that's the continuing story. And I think that the mental shift that people have to undertake uh, to understand where we are with clean energy. We're not breakthroughs away. We are on the path and we just need to continue that, that path. And that path for, for, for solar PV is, is embodied in our SunShot Grand Challenge. And we're more than two thirds of the way to, towards meeting its goal of six cents per kilowatt hour wholesale generation from photovoltaics. And these are just two examples of technologies that are really are ready to go. There are many others like LED light bulbs, electric vehicle batteries, and, and, and several other technologies that have, in my mind, reached the commercial tipping point. And, and these, as these technologies reach the commercial tipping point, what they're doing is they're adding more and more tools to our climate change abatement toolbox. Let me give a, a, a slight preview of the way we work in EERE and the way we look at things. You don't need to read this chart in any depth. This is a little bit of a preview of what's in our EERE strategic plan that's gonna be published here in a few, in a few weeks. But, but I wanna just kinda of give you the, the mental image of how we work towards bringing clean energy technologies down the cost curve and, redu and reducing their, their fundamental costs. So we take a, a suite of technologies across uh, all kinds of uh, uh, development pathways and across uh, different technology uh, development levels. And as, as the technology progresses down this cost curve from left to right here, the investment tends to clarify uh, to, to a few options for, for a few winners. Private investment grows, and the nature shifts of the investment shifts from R&D to a more market-based effort. None of our investments are permanent, and we exit at various times if the technology can't compete, if better options are available, or if the technology is adopted by the marketplace. The complexity of EERE's portfolio makes it challenging to describe in the general. But there are common themes and principles shown in this chart that you'll see in the strategic plan uh, when it comes out in, in, again in a couple weeks. Our ultimate goal within EERE is for investments to make energy services more available and reliable while lowering the unincorporated costs, um, the, the social costs of those, those technologies. 
So that's why in this chart, we sh the way we show this is we have, there's really two costs to an energy. There's, there's the market price, and this is, this, is, this is what shows us where our exit points are. That's the lower price down there. That's our, that's our fundamental target. But there is a true higher cost, which includes pollution and the effects of economic vulnerability that are borne by society. So our, our sweet spot is, is operating between these two lines. Like I said, none of our investments are permanent. We, we may end our involvement for any of four distinct reasons. When evaluating a new investment opportunity area, analysis may not be able to identify a credible pathway to market. We may not be able to reach that lower line. In, in that case, we will suspend our investment and retain our option to potentially invest later if a breakthrough changes that energy landscape. There's also represented on this chart the alternative, an alternative comes along that is clearly more promising pathway, gets us to a lower piece of that cost curve more quickly, and we will move on to that, that cost curve. There are also non-technical market barriers, uh, and some of that has been talked about today. If those are determined to be insurmountable or too costly to overcome, we have to exit as well. And then finally, when the technology reaches competitiveness, we don't have much add to, that, to add to that marketplace, then the market takes over, and that is our final exit point. But let, so given that technology landscape, how are these going to finally reach commercialization? And this is the, 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 the final real market barrier that's out there, and that's the grid integration challenge. As technology moves faster and faster, we're inherently going to, going to see more disruptive technologies being produced. But are we ready for them? You know, is the grid ready for them? I think, you know, in my mind, we know that the grid has a number of shortcomings. It's too inefficient, it's too expensive, it's too unreliable, too inflexible, and too unresponsive to meet the needs of the 21st century to incorporate these disruptive technologies that are coming out of both our labs and, our, and, and the private sector. So a couple of years ago, the Department of Energy started a grid integration initiative to look at these exact problems. We needed technologies to be for a more flexible, resilient, and dynamic distribution system, and, that, and one that is ready and accommodating to new technologies. So the grid integration initiative is a multi-program effort at DOE that fo focuses on system optimization, high resolution data, data <laughs> analytics and tools, sensors, control systems, owner economics, and protection and restoration. In February, we held a workshop at DOE with industry, universities, utilities, and other stakeholders, focusing on addressing relevant challenges at the building, campus, distribution, and regional scale. We'll continue to have these workshops going forward, and, and, and this, this remains a big focus of, of the department. Um, I also wanted to, to, to point out that a, a big part of the grid integration challenge, and it's, it's even a little bigger than the grid integration challenge, is, is an understanding of the energy landscape and how these technologies can interact. Uh, one of the big initiatives that the department is undertaking to try to understand that is the quadrennial energy review. This was one of Secretary Moniz's biggest uh, um, initiatives that he brought to the department. Well, we are gonna take, for the first time, really, a comprehensive look at what our energy systems need uh, where, they, where we are today and where we need, what we need to do in order to move forward in, in the coming years. Uh, this, this first uh, phase of the, the quadrennial uh, uh, energy review is focused on transmission and distribution and really does get at the heart of these grid integration challenges. Um, so I, we look forward to continuing to, to work with folks. A lot of the folks in this room, I'm sure, will, will be we'll be interacting with as we develop that. Uh, and that is slated for completion uh, by the end of the year. Let me just move on to one of our, one of our tools that I, j I just wanted to point out, uh, the Energy Systems Integration Facility at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. We undertook this investment uh, in a, a few years ago uh, and has now come online. It's a, 182,000 square foot building, and it houses some of the most advanced research laboratories in the world. But the building itself is also a laboratory. It's working to overcome some of the challenges related to interconnection of distributed energy systems and the integration of renewable energy technologies into the electricity grid. So we're really past the point of wondering whether renewables will be productive enough to start replacing traditional 
electricity production methods. And we're now we're trying to figure out how these all work together, how do all these systems work together. And ESIF is one of the tools that we have to put, put these things together in an environment where we can actually see how they interact, how they talk to each other. And, and this gives us, a, I think, a sense of where we're, what, what, what the, the, uh, the potential reactive integra integrated grid of the future might look like. Finally, let me just, let me just close uh, saying that to me, this is one of the most exciting times to be in energy. It's a, it's a difficult time to be in the policymaking landscape because of, the, of, of, of this rapid l level of change. And I'm not sure our, our policy apparatus has actually figured out how to accommodate the rapidity of, of change. But, you know, uh, um, earlier this year, I, I noticed a series, a nonprofit investment organization, estimated that the world will need a global investment of $36 trillion, or nearly $1 trillion per year over the next four decades to avoid the worst effects of climate change, while supplying the energy needed and managing the demand of, the global, of global economic development. And that sounds like a lot, <laughs> and it is a serious investment. But it's small change when you compare it to the world gross domestic product that was $72 trillion in 2012. And I would argue it's one of the most productive investments that we can possibly make to bring literally millions of jobs while um, laying the foundation for a future energy economy that can support everything that we need without the, the threat of, 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 of climate change uh, costs. And doing nothing is simply not an option because it would be far more expensive than any, than any estimate for a, abatement going forward. And as and it was also mentioned earlier, these are investments in large measure that are gonna happen anyway. We're going to have to make investments. And infrastructure in the United States needs to be upgraded. Infrastructure in the developing world doesn't exist in many cases. So these things are gonna get built. The question is, will we build them with an eye towards the future or an eye towards the past? And in our view, within the Department of Energy, we simply can't afford to be at the back of the train. We have to be at the front leading, leading the world in these industries. We can't get off the path we're on, and we can't interrupt the progress that we're making. Investing in clean energy isn't a decision that limits our economic potential. It's an opportunity to lead the global clean technology markets that are forming right now. So with that, let me wrap up, and, and I'd be happy to take some questions. Thank you. Mike, thank you so much. I think we'll, we'll basically take questions at this point. I have one that I would like to begin with. Um, we spoke a little earlier um, this morning, Mike, um, about the advanced vehicle technology program that I understand Secretary Moniz wants to reinvigorate. Uh, I'm speaking as a beneficiary of this program, uh, as a Tesla maniac. Uh, you know, I think this program has had a lot of political flack, um, maybe some fair, maybe some unfair. Um, but I guess the thing that strikes me about it, and hopefully you can comment on this, is that it doesn't matter to me if there are 23 or 33 or 43 absolute failures. If, it, if one, one program gets out there and absolutely changes the world. Uh, and I don't know if we've seen that yet. Uh, what are your, what's your prognosis for a, a, a reinstatement of the program and and uh, success of it. Uh, thanks. Um, so, uh, you know, I was involved in the in the in the, the drafting of that program back for for Senator Bingaman, and um, and I think that we had two primary objectives uh, in in putting that program in place. And one one that's been largely overlooked is that, you know, in the in the automotive sector, it's a global industry, and so you know there is not only in an a decision point on do we do we go down a particular technology pathway, but where do we build it? When, once we've decided we're going to build it, and and you know, just to be upfront about it, I mean you know all things being equal, our 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 global competitors are putting together substantial packages to try to pull that production overseas, and so one of the things that we thought could potentially tip the scale was was a uh, a financing program. And we think it did. You know, if you look at, at, at Ford's 
scale of investment as they went through a dramatic upgrade of their facilities and built uh, increasingly advanced technologies, they made the decision to, to make those largely in Michigan as a result of the $5 billion they were able to borrow from that program. Um, but the important thing was also to, to create the opportunity within a, within a technology company, within, within a, an OEM, to, to take a little bit more of a technology leap. They knew they had to comply with CAFE. There's a, there's a sort of a steady compliance pathway uh, with upgrading your technology in CAFE, but it doesn't have to go fast. You know, it doesn't have to, you don't have to leapfrog to the next technologies. You, you, can, you can make tweaks along the way and you can probably keep up with CAFE. What we wanted to do was create the opportunity space so that if somebody really wanted to, to take, a, take a leap, to jump to the next technology level and to try to get ahead of their competitors that way, the government would, would be able to stand there with them and, and make that an easier leap for them to take. And I think we did see that also bear, bear out. Uh, you know, I think you know, Tesla might have, could very well have been a successful company w without the program, but I think they would argue they couldn't have done anywhere near what they've done as fast as they've done without that program. Um, and, and I think that Nissan would, would back that up as well. You know, and moving their battery production from overseas to the United States, they almost encapsulate the entire program in their one, in their one loan. They move, they move battery production that was originally in Japan to, to Smyrna, Tennessee, and they, they leapt into a marketplace that really didn't much exist, and that they did, really didn't need for CAFE compliance. Now, now they are as, as committed to that technology as, as anybody. Um, I think, you know, on the revitalization of the program, I think one of the, one of the central um, difficulties with the program was that the supplier community, for a variety of reasons, didn't realize that they were eligible to, to get into the program and, uh, in, in large measure. And, and I think if people who sort of follow the auto industry realize that the suppliers are actually the technology drivers in large measure of that, of that industry. Uh, and so while we got some good uptake, I think, from the original equipment manufacturers, the large, the integrators of the technology, and, and, and um, we didn't get the kind of penetration into the supplier community that I think would really help us advance the technology. So that's really the heart of the restart of the program. And uh, I think we've done a lot of outreach, and they've tried to, to <coughs> tweak the, you know, the, the, the bits of the program that didn't work for that community. And it'll be an ongoing process, but I'm very hopeful that we'll, uh, we'll see some, some, other, some more big wins out of that program. Great. I'm going to um, just follow that up for one second. One of the objections to the program is government shouldn't be picking technology winners. How are you going to avoid picking technology winners? For example, with natural gas, uh, you know, electricity, other kinds of motive forms uh, be eligible? Or do you have winners in mind that you want to steer? No, I mean, so, you know, the way the program is designed is, and the way most of our programs are designed is it was with an objective. You know, in, in ATVM, it's very explicit. It's got to be 25% more fuel efficient than, than, than its competing products. Um, you know, and, and in, in, the, in the loan programs generally, it was to avoid uh, uh, the carbon pollution and, and other, uh, other criteria pollutants. So, you know, I think having clear objectives in mind isn't, isn't picking a winner. Um, it's, it's actually allowing uh, them to compete with incumbent technologies, which have all the natural advantages of incumbency. Um, the, the market at the end of the day picks the winners and losers. Um, and, you know, we, we, we exist in a market economy. Um, but, you know, it, it, is, it has always been the case, as far as I'm aware, that uh, big technology shifts need some kind of support at their initial phase. Uh, whether you look at, you know, I showed these, these great cost curves of, of wind and solar and the like. They're curves, right? I mean, at the beginning, the first, the first ones that roll off the line are pretty expensive. Uh, the, the first Teslas that roll off the line are pretty expensive. Um, but that is the way technology works. And they, you know, that sort of lubricating that market, allowing them to get into that marketplace 
allows the competitive pressure then to, to pull those costs down. And we're seeing it across the board I, in, in all the technologies that I mentioned and in many others. Uh, LED lights is another great example. You know, the first LEDs, again, uh, you know, we had a we had a lighting prize that was that was uh, authorized in the 2007 energy bill, that Philips won with a, a 60 watt uh, um, bulb replacement, LED bulb replacement. The first ones they tried to sell were 40 something dollars, and you know, even though they could make the case, and it and it was accurate, right, that this was actually in the long term best interest of a consumer, it was worth 40 something dollars because it lasts. 15 years, you're never gonna replace the thing, it gives you the same quality of light, and it uses one-sixth the energy. That's still a hard, a hard thing for, for, for a consumer to, you know, to think of a light bulb as an investment and instead of a, of a, of a disposable good. But we got that, you know, and, and Philips said, because they won that, because that prize was there, they accelerated their, their production timetable by on the order of three to five years. So they brought that thing to market probably you know, definitely faster than they would have, maybe faster than the market was ready for. And so they didn't sell much at that price point. But within a year, you had competitors from Cree uh, and, and, uh, and also overseas competitors. Both Cree and, and Philips tend to produce most of their stuff in the United States. Um, and now you can go and you can buy that same bulb, that same, that same value proposition for nine or 10 bucks at, at Home Depot. That is, you know, that is an incredible market win that was lubricated by a relatively small upfront investment and, you know, in, in, uh, fr from the government. And I, I sort of think of these things all in that same context. Thanks. Um, did I misinterpret that? It seems awfully low. Um, so that's an awfully complicated graph. I, I actually went back and forth on whether I should even put that up there. So what that is is a is an aggregate of a number of different models that have been produced in, throughout academia. And what you saw was the different costs of carbon applying different discount rates going forward. Um, there is a rich body of literature arguing about what's the proper discount rate to apply. I, I know there's economists in the room who would love to probably argue about this. Um, but, uh, yeah, and it, but, you know, and, and there, and, but I, what I, and so the, what you saw, the, the lowest one I think is $12, is applying a 5% discount rate. Um, I'll say from a social perspective, that's, that's a very, very high discount rate to apply. I mean, that's discounting our, our children to a degree that I don't think that, that social uh, policy is really willing to accommodate. So that isn't the number we use. Uh, the, the social cost of carbon that is actually computed by OMB is an aggregate of, of these different, they run all these different scenarios through these different discount rates and then they average them together. I think it, today it's over 30, 30 something dollars a, a ton in, in the current regulatory environment. Anybody? In all these publications on solar energy, and I have done one of the presentations in 2008, one of the probably first one on this for the NCAC, uh, they show capacity in kilowatts, megawatts, whatever. Um, but this is really a little unfair. I mean, in, in, in scientific publications, they put a P, a small P letter, which is peak capacity. So for a solar panel, it may be 10 minutes a day. Is there any way that uh, you know, the research, you use some sort of comparators in order to, to bring solar power capacity to align it with conventional coal or gas that is online for 24 hours a day to show the real, real capacity as opposed to exaggerating this, this sort of these numbers. Right. I mean, so there's, actually this is a distinction that you see throughout the power sector, right? There's, there's nameplate capacity and, 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 and then the actual capacity factor. Um, you know, a, a coal-fired power plant doesn't run 24 hours a day. It runs, uh, its capacity factor is much less than its nameplate capacity. Um, and then we have peaking resources and the like. I, I, I think, but two more fundamental answers to your, to your question. We have done a, a fair amount of research within the department on, on how, um, 
when you have integrated resources, when you have large balancing areas, for example, and you have the ability to have loads and, uh, and um, generation react to each other, that you actually get, um, you actually can get a, an incredible amount of balancing out of that system, just out of a smart reactive system. And so we, we actually published a scenario uh, in the Renewable Energy Future Study that showed that with sort of minimal investments in the storage side of the equation, you can actually get to a penetration level of renewables where, where renewables are taking up about 80 percent. This is in the, in the, in the future. Uh, but with, well, with existing technologies, about 80 percent of our, of our demand can be met. And that's following the peaks and, and, and the troughs of, of demand. The other part of it, though, is you know, we do a lot of fundamental research on, on, on storage. On, on, and um, I think one of the interesting things, I didn't, I didn't put it up there, but we do have, uh, we're seeing a similar uh, cost curve with, the, with deployment uh, of, of batteries. And so we actually, uh, I think, are, are pretty bullish on the opportunities that that could present in the next you know, 10 to 15 years. Um, so I think, and particularly when you start thinking about these, these two things together, when you have a, 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 a grid with a lot of sen sensors and controls on it, uh, immediately reactive capacity, and then a, enough storage that you can buffer um, then I think you can, you know, then, then those numbers will look a lot closer <laughs> to, uh, to the name, nameplate capacity. Quick it's about several years ago I read about uh, prospects for nanotechnology applications in batteries, if, if I'm not confused. I'm not a technology expert. Mm -hmm. um, and the story was that batteries, some experts were expecting that uh, storage can increase by 40 times. Are we anywhere close to this? Or, I mean, there's of course this progression curve as well. How far are we from actually realizing this, this opportunity? Because storage is, at, in the end, right. the big, big uh, constraint for, for renewables. Well, so I'm a lawyer, not a technology guy. So, um, and, but we do have technology folks who can, who can answer that question a lot more uh, directly. Um, I, whether it's whether it's nanotechnology, whether it's you know whether it's just process improvements, um, I, I think one of the things that I find most most fascinating actually is if you track those cost curves, most of the time what they what they will track closest to is deployment, and so you know with each doubling of of, of deployment you get somewhere on the on the order of a twenty percent reduction in in cost, uh, and so. Um, and I, that's the point I was trying to make earlier is, yes, there are breakthroughs out there on the horizon, but in my view on the technologies that we're talking about today, we're not a breakthrough away from commercial competitiveness. We are, we are, in, we are on the, in, the right incremental curve to see these things deploy in the very near future. Those things might, might be a part of how those costs are reduced, but we don't need them. We're not, we're not waiting anymore. We don't need to wait anymore. People, it's almost, uh, it's, it's almost to uh, Bob, why don't you get the last question? Um. Yes, I, I'm, I'm really troubled by some of the stuff I'm hearing today. Um, our, our, the whole climate change problem is a global problem. It's not a U.S. problem. It's not an OECD problem. You know, no matter what we do to reduce our emissions, we're not going to make a dent in this problem unless we do something about China and India and the rest of the developing con uh, countries in the world. And, you know, we're developing very expensive renewable energy technologies. These, these technologies are only existing because of the massive subsidies that we've thrown at them. Those, those, those technologies are not viable in underdeveloped countries that can't afford those, those subsidies. And it seems to me that, that what we ought to be looking at is developing technologies that we can transfer over at a reasonable cost to these other countries. That's the only way we're going to solve the greenhouse gas problem. Well, we agree on the, on, on the conclusion. I, we don't agree on the premise. Um, the, uh, in fact, these renewable technologies are already deploying uh, quite a bit overseas. Uh, they are affordable. Um, the, um, the amount of so-called subsidy in, in, in these is, is actually a quite small uh, compared to their, to their end cost. One of the things that I think is really interesting, actually, when you look at the United States, is 
we, we, we burden renewables with what we call integration costs. You know, these are, these are costs that, um, that we have to, that, that somebody has to bear, you know, to put these, these on the system. And, it, and some of those costs are things like the wind blows at night, right? And the wind, the wind blows at night, and therefore you have baseload generation that has to spin down. Well, that's a cost to the system because of the way our system is designed. Now, in the developing world, you're not necessarily gonna design your system that way. You're not gonna have must take power. You're gonna design your system to follow your load and to follow your demands. You're also probably not going to have a grid of, you know, an interconnected grid of high, high voltage uh, lines from, from coast to coast. The, the fact of the matter is the cost of these technologies at a fundamental level with, with integrated planning and design makes them a much more affordable option in many, of the, in many of the developing countries because they don't, precisely because they don't have the sunk costs that we have in the United States. People, let's get both. Good mic.